Thank you, Martin. Well, it's a distinct uh, pleasure to be here to address uh, you. And uh, I knew uh, that uh, there was going to be a high bar, and, and Martin has just set that bar even higher. Uh, but um, I'm really, really happy to be able to tell you a little bit about uh, one common thread that has run through uh, much of my career here at uh, Michigan um, that uh, has to do with locating the nodes. And by the end of the lecture, you'll see what um, uh, I mean by this, uh, uh, this, this simple phrase. Um, but uh, in a nutshell, what we're after and what we've been uh, trying to solve for the past um, uh, 30 odd years is um, the uh, categorization of different types of methods uh, for localizing geographically, localizing in spaces we can't see or even comprehend, but projecting them onto spaces that we can. So looking for relationships that uh, lie within high dimensional data that's way beyond our ability to understand in uh, the simple connect the dots uh, uh, on a map. So what you're gonna see in this talk is a, um, a somewhat chronological, but also um, a somewhat um, um, uh, motivated uh, uh, description of this thread of research. Uh, from uh, both geopositioning and from um, the perspective of health. Those are the two areas I chose to, to concentrate on. First, I want to just acknowledge um, the person who I chose as um, uh, this named um, uh, Distinguished University Professorship. Uh, I only met John Holland a couple of times. Uh, he was a giant. Uh, in the field of complexity, adaptive systems, um, and wrote uh, uh, some very influential papers and books. And I couldn't think of anybody more fitting uh, for um, uh, my uh, vision of what I would like to aspire to than someone who has crossed so many disciplines himself uh, and um, has served uh, in uh, so many different capacities uh, in terms of uh, both uh, teaching, research, and service uh, to, to the profession, in his case, psychology, computer science, and electrical engineering. This is something we all know about, we all very familiar about uh, with in terms of uh, location. Um, we want to um, find a way to get from Ann Arbor to Chicago uh, that doesn't go through the major highway system. And so we turn on uh, our uh, Google Maps and we follow uh, what Google Maps tells us over, over time uh, to get us to our destination. So global positioning uh, and uh, currently indoor positioning systems uh, allow us to effectively navigate and understand uh, uh, geography of uh, uh, of, of things uh, such as our car or of people such as our friends um, in terms of uh, their relationship to us in a spatial uh, a domain. So Internet of Things um, is uh, one of the, uh, the key uh, areas that has benefited from localization. Uh, location of things is, is a relatively new term that's being used of uh, uh, the past year or so to denote the enabling uh, uh, property of um, localization by uh, positioning uh, uh, in, in various uh, domains, whether those might be wireless or Bluetooth uh, uh, or GPS or acoustic or what have you, in order to better place ourselves in the context of, um, of, the, of the world this in, in, in spatial coordinates, and in order to better place the things in relationship with each other so that they can network together. They know where each other uh, lie so that they can, uh, they know what, in what range um, uh, their, um, uh, uh, their uh, sister devices are and therefore set up a network uh, to communicate and uh, enable 
the Internet of Things. When you look at the Internet of Things um, and location, uh, we can place it into the context of the big data landscape. So this is uh, a regularly updated uh, uh, rendition by Matt Turk, who's um, uh, at the uh, First Mark uh, uh, Corporation that uh, uh, basically tries to give a landscape of the areas within data science, big data, machine learning. It's a very complicated map, as you can see, lots of different uh, pieces ranging from um, uh, the uh, data uh, sources and APIs uh, to um, applications and analytics and so forth. So location is on that map. It's a little piece of that map uh, and it relates to localization in, uh, in space with Foursquare, or Uber, Google Maps or what have you. Uh, but you can also see location uh, imbued and infused in uh, areas of uh, uh, data sources and apps in, in uh, of course, I just mentioned Internet of Things, uh, in uh, tracking uh, in airspace and, and sea, uh, uh, transportation uh, uh, vehicles, uh, tracking people, um, uh, and uh, uh, health, of course, uh, tracking with Fitbit um, uh, people's health habits. Uh, running habits and so forth. If you start to look a little closer, you can see location appearing in other places on this map. Uh, and uh, in terms of the industry applications in the life sciences, uh, in precision agriculture, precision um, health, um, advertising, government, finance, and so forth. Location is very important, right? It, in terms of uh, the uh, landscape. Uh, of, of big data for industry, um, and this is really what this is uh, representing here because these are, um, uh, uh, these, these are, if you like, profit centers of various um, companies except uh, uh, for some of the public source uh, uh, and open access uh, apps that are listed here. Um, these, are, these are what are driving much of the information economy. So uh, clearly uh, with uh, applications that, uh, uh, that can determine lo location uh, uh, very uh, accurately and in relationship to, uh, say, the, uh, you as an applicant for a loan and the population of uh, individuals who have been uh, approved for a loan uh, and those that, who have not been approved, um, there's a, a, an ability of, on the basis of big data um, and on geographic location uh, where you live and so forth uh, uh, to, um, to, to make a, uh, 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 let me say, a better informed decision on making a loan. Um, of course, that brings into the issue of security and privacy, which is, of course, another uh, location, uh, a, a danger, if you like, of, of uh, the uh, uh, unfettered uh, uh, sharing of data about uh, someone's personal location uh, that uh, is not consented by that individual. But we can uh, go further and start to think about uh, location not in spatial coordinates, where you are, where you live, uh, where your devices are, but in terms of visualization of data that is just too complex, too high dimensional uh, for us to be able to um, uh, visualize without putting it into the context of a geographic map. And that's what's known as uh, a visualization or dimensionality reduction uh, that I'll be talking about uh, uh, in, in a minute. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we can also look at machine learning as a critical component because in performing these dimensionality reductions to visualize clusters of, uh, uh, of, of the population uh, uh, that, say, are uh, susceptible to uh, succumbing to an infection versus those that are not based on visualizing uh, relationships between their, uh, their genotypes, um, that uh, machine learning becomes very, uh, very key a property here to, uh, to find the right types of classifiers and uh, projection spaces in which to extract uh, visual, uh, not geographical, but visual information. 
Um, and so uh, social analytics is another example. So what I'm, I, I'm, I'm wanting to do here with this uh, motivation is to give the broader perspective of uh, locating the nodes. We have up here at the top left the uh, example that uh, we're all familiar with that I just mentioned with Google Maps or, or Apple Maps or Here Maps. Um, but we can also seek to locate uh, patients on, in, uh, on the plane on the basis of, say, their, um, uh, their, their analytes in a blood sample. Um, so patients in red might be those that are highly susceptible uh, to uh, succumbing to an infection, whereas those in blue are um, uh, resistant to that infection. And uh, uh, one can look uh, also at uh, trying to uh, project um, uh, text histograms to classify different types of documents to cluster documents that might be um, from one domain against those from, the other, from another domain, like in this example that came from uh, uh, one of my students, Kevin Carter, uh, in, that I'll be talking about some of this work in a minute in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, screening uh, for uh, bone cancer. Uh, but uh, clusters of different document classes enable one to better uh, get an idea about uh, the usage of, of, of language uh, in uh, different domains of computing, science, uh, uh, and so forth. And then another uh, localization problem is uh, uh, to localize uh, uh, viral uh, 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 sequences, amino acid sequences, um, in a, um, uh, a network that indicates by the centrality of a particular virus, if a virus mutates uh, from uh, uh, its uh, initial, uh, uh, say, appearance, mutation, where it infects a number of people, uh, let's say, in Taiwan, and it starts to mutate, and the people uh, carry the virus uh, to Japan and, and to, uh, uh, to Australia and so forth, looking at centrality of the viral sequence can tell you where these sort of critical points of where the virus transforms, which can then lead to um, a better ability to uh, predict uh, what kind of vaccine to design for the next year. So location within the network. There's nothing spatial about this example, but these are nodes just like uh, nodes of, uh, of, of a network of smartphones uh, that we all carry uh, can be interpreted as nodes. So let's start from the beginning or near the beginning. Um, if you look back and consider spatial localization, uh, it's been um, uh, an important area uh, uh, of, of interest to uh, scientists, geometers, philosophers um, uh, since the classical times. Um, the, uh, what I'm showing here is Gemma Frisius, who was a, um, a geometer and physician uh, in um, uh, in Belgium uh, in the 16th century, and he basically invented triangulation. And triangulation is the, uh, the principal method that's used to geolocate and uh, to find out where uh, your car is when you're driving down the street in Ann Arbor or in a, in a city you're not uh, familiar with, uh, given that um, uh, all that uh, is, is available to the system that determines your location uh, is uh, our distance measurements or angular measurements to your car relative to known locations, known uh, 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 wireless or uh, a cell, a tower, uh, base stations. So finding the geocoordinates in this case was uh, important to Gamma Frisius uh, because uh, the distance between Antwerp and Brussels was known, their positions were known, but he didn't know the, dis the distance to Middleburg, which is right on the border between the Netherlands and Belgium, which apparently had some importance uh, in the, um, at that time period uh, in terms of territorial um, uh, uh, competition between the two countries. So you can determine an unknown location if you know two uh, locations uh, uh, exactly. Uh, and that's what this, uh, this type of triangulation allows you to do. And I'll talk a little more about that in a minute. We're not going to get into trigonometry here. Uh, we all studied that as high school students, and I don't want to 
uh, to throw us back into uh, that, that period. But uh, I, I uh, want to uh, emphasize that this triangulation idea had tremendous impact, um, that uh, it uh, was used by Delambre and Mechin in their expeditions to basically determine the radius of the Earth uh, back in the early 1800s, a 20-year epic which is brilliantly described in a, in a book on, um, uh, on, on Delambre and Mechin's uh, expedition. Um, and uh, multidimensional scaling, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is an, uh, basically a way to do geopositioning triangulation, but in very high dimension, it's not, not just in space, um, uh, led to the confirmation of chronology of Plato's works. Um, so Timaeus uh, to the Republic. And um, uh, by visualizing in one dimension over a time uh, scale, uh, very high dimensional data based on um, basically syllable uh, uh, long short uh, coding of the last sentence of all of Plato's works basically confirmed the, the, uh, uh, the chronology. Um, so um, just a little bit of, of uh, visualization here. Uh, I'm not going to be covering much math in this talk, but there will be a few concepts that might get a little uh, dangerously close. And I'll very quickly uh, go through the, the slides uh, in, in, in that case. But uh, uh, geolocation from pairwise distance is actually very simple when you think about it, uh, just uh, from the point of view of, of intuition. If you have two known locations, x1 and x2, so these uh, locations have been uh, uh, determined uh, to some very high accuracy, you know the distance between those locations, um, and then you want to find the distance, you want to find the location of x3. Well, if you can somehow determine the distance of x3, that position of your car uh, from your smartphone that's inside the car in your pocket, um, uh, if you can determine the distance to each one of the known locations, then what you get is this triangle. And that triangle um, is important because uh, this delta 3, 2 and delta 3, 1 that are the two, the two distances from the known uh, uh, positions to the unknown position x3, if you draw a circle around it for uh, assuming that uh, you know, the uh, uh, distances are, uh, uh, you're looking at distances in a, in a uh, what is, what's called a Euclidean space. It's just you get circles of uncertainty. And the intersection of those two circles gives you two locations, two possible locations for the unknown uh, uh, smartphone. Um, one of them is the true location. The other one is the location that's right on top here, right? So you have a, an ambiguity, which can be removed if you add a third known uh, location uh, uh, to, with which to, to measure distances. So everything boils down to measuring distances. If you can get a, 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 a handle on measuring the distance to unknown objects uh, relative to known objects or devices, then you can determine those unknown positions. And um, uh, you, can, you can show that this is equivalent to knowing the, knowing the distances, so knowing the distance matrix, as we say, all the distances, is equivalent to basically knowing all of the correlations. So those, those of you who, are, uh, who, who work in fields where correlation is important will appreciate that um, uh, correlation plays an enormous role in, in similarity, uh, studies of similarity between objects, right? Objects are very highly correlated together if they're highly similar and have uh, representations that are close to each other. And that's, obvious that that should be related to the distance between them, right? Uh, distant objects uh, uh, are, are not similar, certainly in terms of space, but it also uh, turns out they're not similar in terms of other features that we uh, can't associate immediately with, with spatial features. So that's, that's a piece of math I won't uh, bother uh, dwelling on. Uh, but this, this leads directly to multidimensional scaling. Uh, developed uh, in the 30s, um, by two uh, mathematicians, Young and Householder, uh, which basically says if you have a high dimensional object, and let's say this is three dimensions here, so this, this could be a spatial coordinate right on the Earth in three, dimension, in three dimensions, uh, you know, longitude, latitude, and uh, height, altitude, um, uh, but uh, it could be much larger. And if, in fact, all of the uh, structure in the devices or the different uh, 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 
features uh, that represent each one of these points. So those could be people, they could be text, documents, and so forth. Um, they can be, you can extract uh, a spatial representation in two dimensions simply by using what's called PCA, right? And principal components analysis, which is a decomp decomposition of the covariance matrix, the correlation matrix I showed before. And then this can be, uh, this can be performed uh, by matching distances. So again, a little bit of math here, some equations. Let's just you try to, to, to minimize the sum of the, the, the errors or the residuals between the measured distances delta ij and the uh, distances with the presumed or putative positions that you um, uh, are, are guessing that that unknown set of objects and, and devices lies. Okay, so um, that's, the, that's really most of the talk right there. Is, and I'm going to be now going through several examples where we extended uh, this notion of uh, using distances or using correlations uh, for very high dimensional data to extract information uh, that uh, will enable us to, uh, to locate the nodes, right? To, to effectively um, uh, be able to uh, give a diagnostic aid to the clinician on where a patient lies in terms of their genotype uh, or uh, locate the set of genes uh, in a, a gene assay, which are highly predictive of uh, uh, a um, highly symptomatic acute infection. Okay, so looking at the nodes in, in sort of in, in, in the spatial domain, uh, in network self localization was one of the first areas that uh, really enabled the, uh, the, the emergence of the Internet of Things because it enables. Um, the, uh, uh, the determination of locations of many different devices, given a few known anchor devices, one, eight, and nine. Uh, this is in an environment uh, where you have uh, uh, potentially a lot of what's called fading. So um, uh, if you don't, if you want to extract distances from the received signal strength between devices, uh, closer devices will have stronger signals, right, than the devices that are far away. We've all experienced that with our smartphones in parts of, bil of the building that are uh, invisible or at least uh, shadowed uh, relative to the, uh, the cell uh, uh, base uh, uh, stations. Um, so uh, nonetheless, as long as, the, as, as that distance relationship to receive signal strength is the same over in the or relatively the same over the entire uh, uh, extent of this network, then uh, you can uh, determine the positions of the nodes. And so uh, geolocation is the, is the uh, issue. The value, of course, is to establish a network, as I mentioned before. Uh, time of arrival or receive signal strength, which I just mentioned. Uh, encode distance. It takes more time for uh, a, a pilot signal to traverse a larger distance. And you can measure that. Uh, and it also attenuates the signal over larger distance. And you can also measure that. And so there's lots of uh, uh, there's methods that we've developed uh, and published. These are my two most cited papers uh, with uh, several thousand citations that uh, uh, appeared uh, as the uh, Internet of Things and, and other types of localization uh, technology was being developed. And we, we did some, uh, uh, some experiments. And I won't bother uh, dwelling on this because I want to get quickly to the more uh, current work of uh, locating nodes in high dimensions where um, uh, uh, we can um, relate uh, the location directly to a, uh, uh, an outcome, uh, which in, in, in the uh, examples I'm going to show in a second uh, are uh, health related. So here it is. Here's the first example I'm going to uh, mention. So this is locating the nodes not for a, a spatial position of smartphones, but for the distribution of cells. And not just cells, but uh, the cells uh, uh, type uh, in terms of what's called a flow cytometry profile. So in flow cytometry, uh, this is a single cell assay, um, a, a fairly old one developed in the 60s, that uh, places uh, a single cell in a blood sample of a, of a, of a patient into 
a multidimensional space uh, where each dimension corresponds to a different uh, characteristic property of that cell. So there, some of those properties are morphological. Um, so um, uh, the, the uh, forward scatter or side scatter that tell you about cell shape or cell size. Others are fluorophores that tell you about uh, the, um, uh, the, the metabolism of the cell uh, against a particular antibodies or proteins. So there's multiple dimensions. This is a particular case where what I've shown, I'm showing here is location in this visualization of three dimensions of a six dimensional flow cytometer. And what I'm not showing here, I'm not showing cells. These are not cells of, a, these are our different patients. So what you should see in red here are patients with one type of um, uh, mild dysplastic syndromes, which is a type of uh, bone cancer. Um, and then in blue is another type, it's another type of bone cancer. And so each one of these is a person. And what you can do by, uh, by embedding this high dimensional, six dimensional, in, in the case of a four color cytometer, a flow cytometer, is that you can now help uh, the, uh, the pathologist to visualize where the patients lie. So if they have a new patient, say this blue one, they can now associate that patient either with uh, this type of uh, bone cancer or that type of bone cancer based on the distance, the relative distance, locating that node in the context of those two clusters of, of patients. Um, so this was work that was developed by a former uh, uh, professor, clinical professor of pathology here, Will Finn, who I think went to head the pathology department uh, at St. Joe's. Um, uh, and so the visualization of these patient so-called immunophenotypes, um, and uh, in this case, we have 32 of these bone uh, cancer patients. And how we accomplish this, this visualization, is using uh, something, a variant of this multidimensional scaling method that I just mentioned. And I want to give you some idea of the complexity of this problem, because I think it's important to, 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 to see that uh, uh, where um, you can use these uh, high dimensional re reductions into a visualiz visualization space for extremely complex types of data. So here is, here is the data. Here's how the data looks for one patient. These are um, about 30,000 cells from a one aliquot of uh, patient blood sample. Um, the, a single cell is right here. So now the nodes are cells, right? They're, they're not patients anymore, they're cells. Um, and so um, this, you, have a, uh, you can label these, the pathologist can label uh, according to the different cell types within the uh, sample, granulocytes and lymphocytes and so forth. Uh, you can color those and then you can, he can pull out grant, all the granulocytes by gating. It's a gating procedure. Uh, uh, throw all the other cells away and just look at these granulocytes, which are still going to correspond to on the order of th you know, several thousand cells. And then the objective is to um, somehow classify this patient's shape of his granulocyte distribution, right? And I'm just, I'm showing here two dimensions, you know, the side scatter and the log, and then this particular antibody, CD45, in the, log, in, in the natural scale. I'm showing these visually, but these are actually six dimensional objects, right? Um, so you want to find out what is the six-dimensional shape and how similar is that six-dimensional shape of this patient's granulocytes to another patient's or to, to your um, uh, population of patients that's stored in your database that have already been di diagnosed with various types of, uh, uh, of MDS. So you want to compare distances not between spatial positions but between distributions, just like we had histograms of, of word occurrences in uh, uh, the, the documents on news groups. Um, here we have, we're going to have distributions over um, these, these shapes. So that's the challenge, and it's just a little bit of math. I'm just showing here that, the, uh, that uh, we're making some assumptions about the patients are statistically independent. The cell samples are, come from uh, basically a random sampling from a, a, a underlying distribution which can be looked at as this nice smooth object. This is again a two-dimensional visualization 
on two of these antibody uh, fluorophores, CD38 and CD30, uh, CD5. Here's the data. There's the uh, favorable outcome in blue and the unfavorable outcome patients uh, in, um, in, in red uh, in terms of the, the, the granulocyte uh, uh, cell distributions. So you have these two distributions that you fit to the data. And now we want to basically find the distance between these two distributions. These are two different patients. And if you find the distance between those two patients, um, you can now uh, use triangulation to locate other patients and so on and so forth. And now you have the ability to set up a, uh, a, a true uh, diagnostic uh, aid that can be uh, used in order to help diagnose. This just shows the complexity of this problem because we we're trying to basically find distances between these very high dimensional objects. These are uh, distributions. They're smooth objects. They're effectively uh, infinite dimensional. I don't have time to explain why they're infinite dimensional, but just let me put it this way, that uh, these are uh, uh, distributions that don't have any sort of finite um, uh, description, right? You can't, you can't use a finite number of, um, uh, of, of descriptors to tell me, to, to, to describe the shape of these distributions. They live in this infinite dimensional space, and so you have to now uh, find a way to embed uh, these infinite dimensional objects into, say, a three-dimensional space. And the way this is done, the way that uh, my student uh, Kevin Carter, uh, who we, we patented this, uh, this procedure uh, for uh, basically doing uh, what's called Fisher information on parametric embedding, where we project these infinite dimensional objects, very complex, ob complex objects that describe the, the, the distributions of granulocytes in, in these patients. Uh, uh, each one of these patients, uh, there are four of them here, gets mapped to the so-called Hellinger sphere, which is where these infinite objects live, infinite dimensional. I'm just showing you a picture here as a, uh, uh, as, as a kind of a, a connect the dots uh, a type of, uh, of analogy. Uh, and then uh, we do a dimensionality reduction by MDS, find the distances. Uh, between these distributions. Well, finding distances on this infinite dimensional Hellinger sphere is not trivial. <laughs> so um, that's why we got the patent, right? Is because we were able to figure out how to, how to basically how to do it. Um, and I'm not going to describe how we do it. I'm just going to flash this and then quickly flash this and then um, flash this uh, particular uh, result, which is um, uh, showing how we're able to improve upon uh, this, uh, uh, this diagnostic projection uh, that, um, that pathologists uh, use that's uh, gating, and it, it, they use for one dimension at a time, uh, find some rectangle of, uh, of, uh, of projection into two dimensions. Uh, this is a completely um, automated, uh, using multidimensional scaling, and uh, this is finite dimensional visual uh, embedding of these highly complex uh, uh, types of, uh, of, of shapes of data. And I won't, I won't go into the math here, but we've improved upon this uh, recently. This is very recent work. This is going to appear in uh, one of the machine learning uh, conferences on how, how to uh, do this better, how to better estimate those distances. It turns out that you know, we had a good idea uh, but you can do better. Um, that's always the case. That's why we, we love to be academics, right? <laughs> uh, so I want to go next to another type of problem, which is to, to locate genotypical sig signatures. Um, so this is quite, uh, uh, quite exciting work that we started back in 2006, funded by DARPA for predicting health and disease. So the objective uh, here is to find a low-dimensional panel of of genes or of proteins uh, or analytes of some sort that are associated with this acute respiratory infection uh, uh, that, uh, that we uh, uh, administered to volunteers in, a, in several challenge studies. And we get this data matrix. Um, so I'm not going to explain this data matrix right now. I'm going to explain it in a minute. Uh, so we want to develop this low-cost diagnostic assay that is can be used basically to, if you take a, a sample of, of uh, a blood sample of a, of a subject, 
when uh, they're uh, feeling uh, like they might be getting sick, that maybe you can use that sample uh, with some machine learning methods to determine what the probability is that they're going to really get a full blown case of the flu, right? And so uh, this allows us uh, to, uh, to, to really uh, try and, and encompass this, uh, uh, this, this ideal of, of precision personalized medicine uh, by uh, uh, being able to build predictive analysis that uh, can predict in, in, into the future uh, uh, and with, with a level of confidence that could help clinicians make decisions about treatment, about uh, uh, prognostics, and so forth. So there's dictionary learning methods that are used. And basically, uh, what I'm going to talk about is these are the, this is the data. We have uh, 23,000 genes. This is on a gene microarray. Uh, so uh, we, if we, you can use RNA-seq. We get even more genes than this. And these are different samples. So we have samples of, of, of subjects before they get, uh, get inoculated. We have samples of subjects that never got sick even after they were inoculated. Uh, we have samples of subjects that got sick but didn't know they were going to get sick after inoculation. And then these are the subjects that got sick and know they're sick. Uh, and so this was done over uh, uh, several uh, challenge studies. This just shows uh, uh, some of the seven uh, challenge studies that we, uh, we helped uh, the Duke uh, uh, and Vir University of Virginia and uh, University College London design. We have a very complicated data matrix of genes, time points, and samples because this is the layout of the, of the experiment. We have uh, subjects that come in. We don't know what, what their response to the viral inoculation is going to be, whether they're susceptible to getting sick or not. All get the same inoculation of, uh, of the flu or a common cold or a respiratory syncytial virus. And then uh, uh, some of them go on to basically just uh, uh, shrug it off. They don't develop any symptoms. Their host immune response is, it gives a robust uh, response that uh, uh, allows them to get through without uh, exhibiting any evidence of, of being infected other than uh, the production of antibody. Um, but they ne never get sick. They don't feel sick. They don't uh, have symptoms. Uh, they don't shed virus. Uh, and then the others that, that do. And so what we have is these three regions of asymptomatic, symptomatic early, and symptomatic late. And what we want to, to, to basically discover is what is the genotype? What, is the di what differentiates this 23,000 dimensional uh, uh, gene sample from uh, one subject to another, uh, which will determine uh, or at least be associated whether that subject gets sick, sick or not? And if we, can, if we can do that determination here, that can, that can save lives, right? Because you can, you can basically take uh, those people in this region and tell them that, uh, you know, they're going to get sick, so they should cancel their travel plans. They shouldn't, uh, you know, associate with uh, uh, the elderly or, uh, or, or, you know, their new, their new grandchildren or what have you. Um, so this is just two of the time courses that came out of this, uh, this study for asymptomatic and symptomatic uh, 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 subjects. So the dots here are, are, are uh, different subjects. These are different times of, uh, from time zero, minus 12 all the way up to, to 108. So minus 12 is common uh, to uh, both those that got sick, the red ones and the blue ones that didn't get sick. And so you see the development of those uh, that did not get sick of this particular uh, toll-like receptor pathway gene, SOD1, uh, whereas it gets uh, somewhat suppressed in those that did get sick. In this case, on the other hand, the, this rig eye uh, 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 gene. Uh, in this case, there was a very robust um, uh, reaction uh, uh, to the infection for the fo those that got symptomatic. So the point is that there are two very different types of profiles here. So how do you discover these profiles? Well, I like to use this analogy. We all love smoothies, uh, and this is this is going to introduce the concept of dictionary learning. Okay, which I. I, I didn't want to give you equations, so instead I'm going to talk about smoothies. So, um, so when, uh, if, if you like smoothies, then, and I love them, um, my wife knows that, uh, I, I like to experiment, and uh, uh, mango, lime, coconut smoothies are, are heavenly. I mean, they're, they're just wonderful uh, uh, things. Uh, and the, so if you want to construct 
a smoothie, you can start with um, you know, uh, some number of mangoes, some uh, number of limes, or maybe half a lime, uh, and some coconut milk. Um, so these are what are called dictionary elements. And I'm going to be called in dictionary learning. So this is representing my smoothie by a dictionary, where the dictionary is mango, lime, and coconut. And the proportions in my volume of uh, smoothie is there's going to be 20% mango, 5% lime, and 75 coconut milk. Okay, so that's how you can, that's the recipe for, for constructing a smoothie. Now what we're, we're trying to do is much harder. We're trying to visualize these complicated 23,000 dimensions. So that could be, you know, uh, perhaps uh, different, different uh, dictionary elements that correspond to those dimensions. We're trying to visualize those. So we're trying to do the opposite of this problem. We're not trying to mix our smoothie. We're trying to take our smoothie and unmix it. And that's what dictionary learning does. Dictionary learning takes the smoothie and it says, I'm going to um, do the analysis and tell you exactly what the percentages of mango, lime, and coconuts are. So um, uh, when I translate this to uh, the, 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 the data set that I have, uh, we had that bid matrix. Each sample was a column, 23,000. Well, what we want to find is, that's our smoothie, right? We have 23,000 dimensional smoothie. And uh, we want to find what constitutes that smoothie. Now, what makes it difficult is we don't know, we have no idea what went into that, uh, uh, that, that particular uh, response, uh, gene expression response, that, those 23,000 genes that, that, uh, uh, that responded to, uh, to the virus. So we actually have a much harder problem because we have to both learn what the ingredients were, and we also have to learn the proportions. We have to do that simultaneously. Now, that might seem impossible, and um, uh, I, I don't have time to explain how we did it, but it's a, um, it's a, it's a standard method in um, uh, what's called matrix factorization or factor analysis, where each one of these uh, is called a factor. These dictionaries uh, uh, elements are called a factor. And then the proportionality measures are, are numbers. So this is the math. Um, uh, you, here, here's a gene sample. That's one of the columns. Uh, this, is, this is an RNA sample from, uh, from an affirmetric microarray. And here is our, you know, uh, our dictionary of mangoes and limes and coconut milk. Here are the proportions here that weight them into, the, into that particular sample. And we, uh, we use these, uh, this method, which we call uh, Bayesian linear, linear unmixing. Uh, to basically find what the dictionary elements are and what the proportions are simultaneously. And um, uh, I'll explain to you why that's important in the next slide. So here, here are the results. Again, uh, so you don't have to worry about this posterior probability business. That just tells us how many dictionary elements we need uh, uh, to, to determine from this data set, this very large matrix of uh, over uh, 300 uh, samples and 23,000 genes. Uh, this is the dictionary. We have four dictionary elements. These are the gene indices. So these are the components within each uh, uh, of the dictionary elements. They're, 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 there are only 12,000 here because we, we compressed the, uh, the genome down to 12,000 uh, using brain array, which I think was developed uh, right uh, in. Uh, did you did that, exactly. So this is the brain array um, <laughs> uh, custom CDF, the, the CDF file. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. right. That's cool. Yeah. Yep, so, uh, uh, so we have 12,000 instead of 23,000. That gets us halfway, I guess. Uh, that's still a lot. Uh, and so what this is telling you is basically uh, that uh, we have th four dictionary elements. The first dictionary element, it's, o it's mainly these genes down here that are enriched in that element. The second element has these genes, third, those genes, and so forth. This is just a way of showing which genes show up in each one of these uh, elements. So now you can talk about pathways. You can talk about factors, uh, factor one, two, three, and four as being these different uh, 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 ingredients of the smoothie. And uh, those correspond to these particular combinations of genes. And now if you look at the first, just the first factor, and you look at the proportions, 
that are associated with that factor. So this, you know, this is the, the amount of coconut milk. Then what you see is when you plot it out in time and, and in subject, you see this really striking uh, uh, effect where those subjects that were adjudicated by the clinicians we work with as not having uh, become uh, acutely infected, they don't have a proportionate response in this uh, coconut milk uh, element, right? Uh, these do, and you can see, in fact, how that response develops as a molecular response. So this is what's called the, the, the proportion map. And um, if we label this with those three re regions I mentioned before, you can pick those out directly. We didn't use any label information. There was no information about who was infected, when they were infected. All this is completely what you call unsupervised, blind to the, to the, the clinical data. All it depends on is the molecular data. And you can see this remarkable um, uh, tracking, uh, the, the molecular, uh, the, the, the symptoms are, are sort of tracking this molecular data. So what this can say is, this, tell, this can tell you is that you can use the, the molecular data uh, to predict um, uh, the uh, symptom severity. Uh, I'm going to talk about this last problem, then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, the most recent of our work, which we're very excited about. And this is using uh, the same types of ideas for reference-aided diagnosis. So this is, this is personalized medicine uh, in, in, in a test tube, right? Um, so we took the same challenge data. Uh, and uh, what we did was we said, uh, what if we uh, took one of the baseline samples of each patient, and we paired it with a target sample when that patient gets, feels sick, and uh, so that, you know, the, the kind of, uh, uh, of operational uh, uh, situation where this would uh, be applied would be, you know, patient comes into the clinic, they get, they get a blood sample, you know, maybe on their, their yearly uh, physical exam, uh, the, that blood sample gets stored away. Uh, uh, some cryogenic, cryogenic uh, storage, uh, and then they start feeling sick sometime later. After exposure, they come back. There's a target sample. And now what we do is we want to use both samples in tandem to basically sequence them uh, or uh, figure out what, their, uh, what the gene expression uh, in, in, their, uh, in their genome is at, from the baseline, the healthy baseline, versus the target sample. So this is locating the genes that are going to classify a person's infected state. That infected state means region one, two, or three. And so we use shedding data in this case. This is a, going to be a supervised uh, um, example. Shed, viral shedding is a strong, uh, a strong indicator of infection. Um, we use some math, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, this reference-aided classifier is uh, also something I'm not going to talk about, but it uses a machine learning method Knows, known as uh, sparse hinge lock, hinge loss, multi block, sparse, uh, multi -block uh, learning, where we generate scores. Uh, this is how, how uh, uh, a score for uh, how likely that subject is to be in that asymptomatic class, not getting sick, right? And two is they're pre symptomatic, but they're going to get sick pretty soon. And then class three is one we don't need a molecular assay for because they're already sick and feeling uh, poorly. So um, uh, running this, uh, uh, this, this, this method, we actually can uh, uh, recapitulate predictor variables that in the reference-aided classifier that uh, highly differentiate the infect uninfected subjects from the infected subjects. And this just shows uh, some, of the, some of the results for the four uh, different types of viral pathogens that we ran for this study over 160 patients. Um, and you can see, again, the development uh, some of these genes are, are highly expressed uh, when uh, right, right prior to uh, the uh, symptomatic infection period of those that got sick. Those are the ones down here. Those are the ones in this column. And then others are more uh, suppressed when that occurs, right? So there's a, a real family of genes that are interacting to, uh, to, to, to predict uh, which one of the regions uh, each uh, one of the patients lies. And this just shows that these are the locations of all the, uh, of these patients um, that um, the blue patients, uh, w which are in region two, the green in region three and, and red in region four, are much better separated using the references, 
than they are if you don't use references. So what this tells you, we have uh, quantitative results here, is that you can get a 13% error reduction in predicting, uh, using an optimal predictor, predicting whether that subject is going to be sick or not uh, uh, with 40% savings on the size of your, uh, of your gene assay. Right? So, um, so this type of approach is very, um, uh, is very promising. Uh, we're, uh, uh, we're working with uh, a company, uh, Host Response, that's run by Jeff Ginsburg at Duke uh, to, uh, to try and, uh, uh, and, and get this uh, into a bigger trial. I'm not going to uh, uh, discuss these other areas because I've already talked enough, uh, but I will, talk, I will give you my conclusions, uh, which uh, you should by now, been, after, after being hit on the head uh, several times, uh, that node localization is a major problem, uh, a major opportunity, and it's a subdomain of data science that just like, like other domains that require uh, extraction of information of value from highly complex data. Um, it's a driver from theory, methods, and applications, as I think I've, I've, I've indicated in this talk. Um, and some of the applications I haven't talked about uh, are some of the work that we're doing currently um, in global security um, and environmental monitoring, uh, but uh, I, I'd be glad to discuss that uh, uh, later uh, or at, at, at your leisure. So major opportunity, just a closing statement, because we are a university who are, our, our primary mission is to teach our students is uh, uh, we have a challenge ahead of us that we at Midas are actively um, uh, talking about and convening the, the, the major players and stakeholders uh, in building the uh, premier data science educational programs at, uh, uh, at the master's and undergraduate level uh, towards uh, programs that can teach students to be perhaps not experts at all of these uh, techniques uh, of uh, data collection and uh, management and analysis and um, validation and statistical uh, confirmation and so forth. But uh, it, for, at least for those fearless students, at least they will be able to um, uh, uh, comprehend the issues and know who to ask and, and what tools to use in order to, to, to put together the pipeline for addressing the types of problems that I've, that I've just mentioned. So thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, and um, I'm, I'm here for the reception, too. So thank you.